So welcome everyone. I'm Molly Rowan Leach and we are in week four of our restorative coaching series. And we had a lot of fun last week with our very special surprised guest, Joe Brummer. Just a reminder that, again, you have two hours worth of one-on-one -on -one coaching, either as an individual or a team, that you can schedule directly with me. And you don't have to do that right now. You can do it um, anytime between now and the end of May. I'll be receiving um, and scheduling private sessions with, with you all, and we do those on Zoom. Um, again, most of you know who I am, Molly Rowan Leach, founder and director of Restorative Justice on the Rise. Uh, warmly welcome you to go and check out some of the new podcasts that have recently been posted there. And um, a feature from Cornell West was just put up recently, uh, thanks to the NACRJ, which is the National Association for Community and Restorative Justice. And that was from his incredibly inspiring talk at the 2015 conference in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So please enjoy the resources that are available to you through iTunes, the podcast, dialogues. If you have a particular dialogue or um, theme that you're looking for, um, we, we can point you in the right direction if you're looking for resources or dialogues that are um, specific. So welcome today. Our, our focus today is on um, family restorative practices in, during these challenging times. And I wanted to just, um, I, I don't wanna take too much time up front because I'm, I'm excited to introduce you to Jessica. But today's overall focus, we're gonna be um, just doing an opening check-in. And that's gonna be with Jessica after I introduce her and she's going to provide a presentation and interactive. And then we're gonna do some Q&A um, with you and then see where we're at time-wise. I know we've been going quite a, quite a ways towards the two hour mark. Today's session is probably gonna be a, a slight bit shorter. Um, an hour to 90 minutes is what we're looking at for today. So welcome if you're just joining us. It's so great to see you all. And um, I just wanna introduce Jessica, who is a great um, and just, she's a good friend and she's a colleague and she's inspired me. Um, you know how people can be in a circle or just in their lives, just you, you know when they're fully present. Well, this is, that's Jessica. And she's a, an extraordinary trainer and practitioner. And she's been in the field of restorative justice for uh, decades. And like I said in the green room before we started, Jessica worked with um, Dr. Beverly Title, who is the extraordinary um, guide and way shower here in Colorado, who unfortunately uh, passed away about five years ago. Um, she coined the five R's of restorative justice, Dr. Title did, and um, Jessica was a close colleague of Dr. Title's, and in today's session, she has some materials actually to, to share with you that were emailed to you. So if you haven't checked your email, there's materials per this session there for you to follow along with as we go. Um, so Jessica, she's, as you can see here by her bio, she's dedicated to creating a more peaceful and connected world. And um, she utilizes and shares her relationship building, sustaining and healing skills. And she works with both individuals and organizations offering workshops and coaching services. And like I've said, she's a very skilled facilitator, coach, peacemaker, and columnist. Um, she is very sincere and authentic, and that's what we love about her so much. And her methodology is grounded in our modern day understanding of how the brain works. So not unlike our friend Lauren Abramson from Baltimore, Jessica has a real uh, understanding of synth the synthesis of neuroscience, um, neurobiology, plasticity, and how that informs our on the ground practice. 
She has, like I said, close to two decades of experience with NVC, otherwise known as nonviolent communication, the work of Byron Katie and spiritual practices, body awareness techniques, and almost a decade of experience as a columnist and restorative justice practitioner. And so, Jessica, just um, such gratitude to you for being here. I'm going to stop my share so we can see each other. <laughs> and welcome, welcome, welcome. And would you start us out with the grounding practice? Yes, yes. Um, I, I just want to say thank you so much, Molly, for the opportunity to be with this community that you've gathered together. And thank you all <laughs> thank you. for participating and being so dedicated to living restoratively and practicing restorative practice. Um, justice practices and processes in your homes and in your work lives and in your communities. It, it's just so touching to know that we're part of a larger worldwide collective. And um, for our grounding practice today, I would love to start you in a meditation. I'm hoping everybody is in a place where they can sit and just relax a bit. Um, and to start the meditation, I, I'm going to ask you to just allow yourselves to fully sit in your chairs and be held by the chair. That is something we very rarely do. Um, and as you do so, just notice the chair holding you and you being held by the chair and let your arms drop to wherever they will. And if it feels right, just close your eyes and breathe in and out. And with every inhale, notice the oxygen that serves you, the air that serves you. And with every exhale, release that which doesn't serve you. Letting yourself relax more and more deeply, planting your feet into the ground, your thigh bones into the seat of the chair, your back into the back of the chair. Breathing in and out. Now I'd like you to notice any smells. Notice any sounds. Notice any flavors in your mouth. What is the temperature of your fingertips? What is the temperature of your toes? What's the texture of your hair? Feeling your hair with your hands. What's the texture of your clothing? Continue to breathe in and out. Take a moment to bow to yourselves and your willingness to learn and grow and develop and keep relational with one another. Feeling deep gratitude for who you are, for what you've experienced and what brought you to this moment. And when you're ready, gently open your eyes, fluttering them open gradually. Notice the colors and the objects around you. If there's anyone near you, just make eye contact with them, or you can make eye contact with anybody on the screen.
And now I'll just let Molly, did you want to continue to say anything or should we just start the presentation? Thank you, Jessica. The only thing I'd like to say is again, an honoring and an appreciation of everyone that's here together. Um, one of the things that I shared with Jessica as we were preparing for today was the wonderful feeling of um, being held in imperfection as a, as a trainer, as a guide, um, per, I think it was the second session um, where I just fumbled in being able to share my screen with you all and you held me with compassion and it turned into, um, in some ways, I think, the ability for us to all show up um, in a way that in these spaces, because they are anxiety producing, um, that you have permission to, for, you know, to not be perfect. So thank you. And, um, you know, just by that knowing that we can hold each other together in that, in this space, in that way, that helps us to step into the spaces we're creating because I know that many of you are in a way that's so deeply authentic and courageous and, and um, safe. So, and I want to honor you, Jessica, because today I believe is one of the first times you've done, um, you know, a webinar of this magnitude and you are one of the most extraordinary trainers. So um, I just, I'm honored that this would be an experience that I get to help hold for you. So I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and thank you, Molly. Yes, this is my first ever webinar that I'm leading or facilitating. So I have a little nervousness and Molly assured me that you're all going to hold me with compassion. <laughs> so I, I'm grateful to that. So I'm going to start sharing the screen. Um, and we can see if that works. Okay, so this is our slideshow. And today the focus is gonna be on family restorative practices during challenging times. A lot of times we think of restorative practices as applying to the criminal justice system, a school system, a work system. And we forget that um, the practices are a way of living that apply to every aspect of our lives, including our family lives. When I go and train in schools, I often encourage um, the school team to consider onboarding parents so that children have the consistency between home and school life. And I think that's true for workplaces as well, just onboarding families. And during the, you've all had a lot of um, conversation about different practices, and I believe you're, you're well informed about the uh, connection circles and can run them. And so I'm going to go into a little more background about what we can do in challenging times as it pertains to how the brain works. Um, thank you for the introduction. So as an overview, I'm going to talk about our purpose. Uh, we've already settled in, and actually uh, Molly's spoken about our purpose too. And as we go through the presentation, I'll be reviewing some past materials as re they relate to family life interspersed with new materials and tools. Uh, I'll talk about how the brain works and how to be biologically respectful, and we'll have a Q&A process. Um, Again, thank you all for your interest and dedication to learning and adopting restorative practices. The um, handouts we have that are, I believe, emailed to you are the assets-based survey of feelings and needs list, which will come in particularly handy in two weeks when there's a NBC primer. Uh, an article that I just uh, wrote about handling stress in these times and the slight slide presentation. So my goal today is to offer you a connecting experience, um, a review of restorative concepts in context of a family practice, a rudimentary understanding of how the brain works and how restorative practices are biologically respectful, and a set of tools 
that you could use with your family and yourself and your colleagues. Um, I won't be tech covering technical issues. This, this is not my forte. And I'm so happy Molly, with all her experience, has made herself so generously available to everybody. Um, time is limited, so we'll only get a small flavor of some tools and adaptations. You can reach out to me personally for elaboration. And if you're interested in follow-up webinar series on restorative parenting and restorative relationships that will soon be launched, my information is at the bottom of each slide. Um, and this is my first time um, doing this. So we have started with our meditation. I would like to also talk about behavioral norms for our paired exercises exercise exercises and then i'd like us to go into breakout to form bonds with one another one-on-one -on -one. um so this meditation that i used if you notice invokes all our senses i like to call it the bringing yourself to senses meditation um, this is a really great way to help people get regulated um, we've talked um, about trauma and being trauma informed. And sometimes trauma happens because we're in such an activated, or we have a trauma reaction because we're so activated and just bringing people to their senses is a good way to uh, begin a relationship that's not in an activated state. There are other recordings of meditations that I've done on SoundCloud and you can just follow that link. Um, so we will conduct paired exercises um, and during the exercises we may reveal parts of ourselves that will require tenderness and i want to make sure that we can all agree to keep what is shared here confidential um, which means not sharing it with anybody else thank you <laughs> um, listening respectfully giving our full attention not offering advice or judgment during or after the session if you want to talk to somebody afterwards, please ask for their permission before sharing whatever they've shared. Uh, be brief so everybody can have a chance to talk and cover materials and allow each other to pass. Um, is this okay with everybody? I don't know how we do that. Just a thumbs up from everybody. All right, thank you. Um, and is there anything else that you'd like to add? And I think we could do that through the chat. There's a couple ways that you can interact um, just through the chat, of course, or Jessica, if you would like, um, we can do a more dialogic um, interactive. And while I'm unmuted, I also wanted to ask a favor if you would be willing to hide your um, the, the screen that is your audio because you're logged in twice. Uh, um, it if you, if you it have, Melissa, work. go ahead. It doesn't quite work like that. Um, so okay. it's when we're viewing a screen and we have the like all the videos on the side, it's easier if you hide all non-video participants because it. I see. Because yeah. it's on her phone, it automatically. Gotcha jumps to her box and so not having that option then means that her screen for me is right under yours i see okay so hiding all the non-video participants should do the trick yeah, <laughs> and then you can hide okay. it when you go back into kind of circle mode thank you thank you all right so if we could do it in chat does anybody have any other guidelines that they would like for us as we create um safe spaces and I'm not sure how to see that. Molly, do you see any chats coming up? Uh, so the forbearance for technical challenges. It's a good one. Thanks, Ron. Um, replace advice with curiosity. And there's a question about wondering about the length of time for the breakouts. So we're looking at about five to 10 minutes for 
the breakouts. And there'll be two, and it depends on how long you want to go if we'll add any other ones. Is that everything? It looks like it. All right, thank you. So we'll be um, replacing, is, is everybody okay with replacing advice with curiosity? All right, super. All right, so right now will be our first breakout. And um, I would love for us to just break up in pairs. I don't know how to do that. So Molly, I'll be relying on you. Um, and during this breakout time, uh, we'll have five minutes for you to share in turn um, what your name is, where you're from, your favorite food, uh, one of your favorite activities and why you enjoy it and what you're hoping to get out of this particular session. The breakout rooms are ready for pairs. So shall we go ahead? Okay, I think that's my cue, right? Okay, we're in a room together. <laughs> I can't hear you. Hey, Katie. Hi, I'm alone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Uh-oh. Um, would you like to go into a different room or just shall we do an interactive? We could, we could do a different, I could do a different room. I okay. want you to be available for Jessica. Okay. Let's be here. Um, this is good because now I get to learn how to put you in a different room. Oh, um, yay. A learning yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is so funny. It was, um, it was pretty funny. I was like, maybe I should just like talk to myself. I don't know if I, I was, yeah. Let's see here. Maybe Let's there was an odd number. Um, well, it, it, it was, it was actually even. Oh, but, um, oh gosh, this is so weird. Like, I think I have to go back to the main panel to, um, here, let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to move you to breakout room one. All right, dear. Okay. And have fun. Thanks. Bye. Okay, I think everybody has partners. Hello. 
our like, future team want to do is that we do to go down the end of the that's what Arai said, you know, but I, I didn't know when she meant or like how much or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, once a week, so you, they last decreased it on the 10th, which would be Friday. So Friday, you can go down to 30 minutes. Okay. Um, and then after, and then the following Friday, 20 milligrams, and maybe 20 milligrams, maybe just, and we'll hold it. For a while? There for a okay. while. Because usually 20 milligrams, that's kind of like the magic those people flare, it's like if they go in the blower, they get 20 milligrams. Got so it. Usually, once usually people at 20 milligrams, so we'll, we might tend to go down slower. So. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. One thing is, um, I was wondering if my Konasik ever came in. We checked yesterday, so it's still pending. So sometimes it takes, it can take up to two weeks, and then uh, I don't know if things are slower. Because of everything. everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, I actually did uh, JCAS. To look and I looked at, I was the one that looked at the portal for him. Uh, so okay. it was still pending. As okay. As well. okay. Yeah. So Sounds maybe we could check on your next appointment. I think it should okay. be on Thursday. Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions or concerns? No. Okay. Can you do a quick check? Yeah, absolutely. Don't know where the. I know um, I think Dr. Uh, they were saying maybe visits here two or three times a week. I think you look so good. I mean, we can have Thursday, but I think two yeah. times a week can be fine. Yeah, that's fine for me. Especially, you know. Welcome as you're coming back in. Hopefully everybody had a chance to get to know one another. 
there were a few people I needed to move over into a new room. Hopefully that worked for you. And Jessica, your sound is coming back. It went into a room of its own. <laughs> That's why we see you, but we're right now unable to hear you. So once the breakout room closes for sure in 20 seconds, um, your audio will automatically return. So we'll just take another moment to let everybody wrap up. And we're back. And Jessica, can you, um, I, I think we may be having trouble hearing you. Can people, uh, I, let's see, I'm looking at your screen. Um, we lost your audio. You had two connections. You, you said you had your phone connecting. Um, and I'm trying to find the, um, could you stop um, sharing your screen for just one moment and I'll be able to find your audio screen because you've got two screens, one for visual and one for audio. <laughs> Melissa, I'm really grateful to you. Thank you. Um, Melissa, how about I hand you um, some host skills to help me right now? Would you be willing to do that? No better. Okay. Let's see here. All right, thanks everyone for your patience. We're gonna grab Jessica's audio here and get back in to things. Um, so her screen is open um, and we can all see her, correct? Yeah, okay, thank you. And So it looks like we lost your audio screen. Um, so, I think that's what happened. Can you hear me now? Thank you. Okay. Yay. <laughs> You're back. Yeah. Very excellent. It was Everybody's very breathing. Everybody is back. Yes. Thank you. All right. Fantastic. So I'm going to go back into sharing the screen, and I hope that the um, process of meeting with each other in pairs just help to bring you more into the learning space. And I'll explain a little more about how that's important because a lot of times we want to correct before we connect. And by creating relationship and focusing on relationship, we can sort of relax into learning more. So I'm going to ba go back to sharing the screen. And there it is. Okay. Um, and I, I, from re reviewing the recordings, I, um, know that the concepts that have already been covered beyond the technical issues are the spectrum of restorative practices, which include relationship building, sustaining and repair processes, the five R's of Dr. Title and the best practices. So one thing I do want to say about best practices, especially in the family, because we are changing dynamics sometimes, um, it's hard to remember that participation needs to be voluntary, which may mean that certain family members will not want to participate at all. And it's just a matter of respecting and honoring them till they get to the point where they do want to. And it's the same in a workplace and in other locations too, in a school setting, confidentiality is important. Um, and I'm saying this as a parent, a lot of times as a parent, I forget that my story and my son's story are very separate and I can't tell his story without his permission. 
And um, so we have a really clear boundary around that. And I encourage that with all my clients that I coach as well. And accountability is important. And modeling that accountability as adults in the household um, by stepping up and saying, hey, I did something wrong. Um, and then transparency about expertise. Um, so one thing I want to say about that is in the learning process, and I even after, I think it's been 13 years that I've been a restorative practitioner, even after 13 years, I'm still learning. And it is so important that I say I'm not an expert and we're all learning together in the process, especially in family life, because we're creating new norms, a new way of being, a new way of living. And um, being transparent about that is critical. And this is a way of life. So having grace for each other, especially ourselves. Um, Molly talked about the goal not being perfectionism. <laughs> the goal is being connected. Um, so I like to say the goal is connectionism instead of perfectionism. <laughs> and, and the great thing about having that framework is knowing that we get to do this again and again and again and keep learning. And as long as we're intending to stay connected to each other, um, we teach the children in our lives and the other adults that you're welcome here no matter what, and you don't have to be perfect. Um, and there's always a learning that goes on for everybody and a development that goes on for everybody. Um, and I look, to, look at restorative practices as, as an investment of time and it pays off in big ways in the future. So um, I, sometimes people say, oh, the, the process hasn't worked. And I, and I ask us to question like, what is it that we're measuring the process is working as or not working as? If the measure is relationship, um, then I think, and the intention is relationship, I think the process works even though we may have hiccups and even though we may have moments of separation, as long as we can go back and reconnect with each other. Um, and I do want to encourage that you reinforce family practices with your workplace or community practices as part of the cultural shifts. Does anybody have any questions about, about this so far? or any comments? I assume they would show up in chat. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna, has somebody added a chat? Yeah, um, Brenda is curious about how to measure relationship. Um, thank you, Brenda, for that question. Uh, and I think it's a way to measure relationship is, is a work in progress. So am I staying connected? Am I placing the relationship um, as being a priority over how I look in the outside world, over productivity, over materialism? Um, and I, I go back to an exercise that I did during a training uh, for schools where we had some teens be our facilitate, facilitator trainers. And we did an exercise, a brownie exercise. And the um, exercise was, okay, we have these five R's as our ingredients. So the metaphor being a brownie. And what in the process of doing the brownie exercise, we realized that the uh, four R's of respect, responsibility, repair, and reintegration couldn't happen if there isn't relationship. So the way to measure is, am I staying connected even in the moments of connect, disconnectedness? Am I willing to come back? Are others willing to come back? Am I holding the other person with grace? Am I holding myself with grace? Does that answer your question, Brenda? And Brenda, if you would like to chime in, certainly just unmute yourself. And that that uh, offer for interaction stands, as you all know, uh, throughout this session today. So if you'd rather speak, 
just um, unmute or ask me to help you unmute. That gives me some idea. Um, I and I'm also wondering how how to measure that in a community or in a family. Um, thinking beyond just you know if you're working in within a family, maybe it doesn't matter about measuring it, but it sometimes people want measurements. And I think the measurements need to be different than the typical measurements that we think about and look at. Because often we can see that there's a change and we can feel it and we know there's a change, but how do you actually um, quantify that in a way that's different from the way we normally do that? So I'm, I, I'm not asking you to answer that question necessarily now. It's just, it's just something I want to really think about. So I, I can say thank you, Brenda. Um, there are surveys of, of um, how do you feel in the culture? So do you have a sense of belonging? Do you have a sense of contribution and desire to contribute? Do you have a sense of um, being valued as an individual? And um, so I think Resolutionaries has done some work with us. And there are some other researchers who have as well. And so those are, I, and I think it's a good question that we all ask of ourselves. When do we feel like we're relational? When do we feel like we're in a healthy relationship? And putting those down in a survey and using the guidelines of other surveys is a good way to start. Am I satisfied in this relationship? Do I feel content? Do I feel safe? Do I have psychological safety? Any other questions before I move on? Uh, there are a couple more. Um, Tom, Hi. you want to go I'm, ahead? Yes, so the question I posed was how do, how can we make, how do you make cultural, I mean, restorative practices culturally relevant? Because this is based in indigenous cultures and I'm sitting here, I'm in New York and I was just having this conversation in the, in the breakout room with um, my partner. And um, just talking about the communication style of New Yorkers, we're very fast paced, we can be very assertive, people can mistake that as aggressive. Um, so when I hear you talking about the values of patience and grace, and I'm like, hmm, how do I cultivate that? <laughs> in a city that <laughs> doesn't necessarily practice that, right? Um, and I'm thinking about the children that I work with, particularly the teenagers and how they show up in the world. And also I'm thinking about a conversation I had with Molly last week when we were talking about how to deliver the guidelines, even the way she talks and the way she sounds um, living in Colorado and what I sound like living in the heart of Brooklyn, <laughs> you know, it's a difference between Mother Teresa and a correction officer, right? So, like, and it has to be a medium balance between me showing up authentically as this New Yorker talking to children from, from New York, um, but, at, but at the same time trying to introduce them to these concepts they may not be familiar with or comfortable with being, being full of grace and patience. So, I know I said a lot, I'll stop there. I, I love that question. Um, I'm a New Yorker. When I go back, sometimes people look at me oddly. <laughs> I wonder what happened to you. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I have to say that intention and motivation are really critical. The words are not as important as cultivating in ourselves this idea that we want to create a culture of belonging. We want to create a culture where everybody is welcome, however they show up if they're fast paced, if they're slow paced, if they're introverts, ambiverts, extroverts. Um, and, and I think the invitation to say, well, what do you need to feel comfortable? So as we did with the guidelines, um, just being willing to say, okay, this is a starting point. Where else do you want to go? And allowing the guidelines to be an evolving document, an evolving set of standards of behavior. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yes, definitely. 
Yeah. So it's, it's always going back to what am I here for? Am I here to try to get an agenda furthered or am I here to create community and, and to connect with people and to assure everybody that they're valued? Any other questions? I love that. Thank you, Tanya. You're welcome. I'm going to mute now. Um, Yanaya um, says, some of us are looking for an energetic shift as opposed to what has been said or shared. And she says, um, in addition, can you speak on that energetic shift? It's a process. And um, it is so important to remember that sometimes it's just sitting in circle after circle and realizing and reprogramming ourselves that um, we get that energetic shift. It's kind of like learning of an instrument. You don't learn it day one, you begin to learn it. And so I think it's so important and critical as we're going through making this energetic shift that we have community that we have people who share our values and our desires to create the cultural shift because it's lonely. It's lonely. And I remember when I first started, started learning nonviolent communication, it feels like eons ago and restorative practices, people would stare at me as though I was coming from Mars. And so what I needed to do more than anything was to make sure there were people around me who understood what I wanted, who could support me. So I didn't feel so lonely and torn as I, as I shifted in the energy. And just realizing this is, this is an undoing of, of years <laughs> of being a different way. So patience, patience, patience. And, and just, uh, I love to sometimes write love letters to myself to just know where my progress has been. So I can think of, oh my God, I used to be so sarcastic and I'm, I'm really grateful right now that I can be with people and, and just appreciate them however they show up. Those are some tools that we can have and just having, having our cheerleaders. I can't tell you how important cheerleaders are in our lives. I remember sitting down with Beverly uh, and doing a video of her, and she, she talked about her friend being her cheerleader in a world when she was trying to create something new and trying to show up in a, in a way that is not um, celebrated in our world, and she needed her cheerleader, her friend. Does that answer the question? Uh, partially it does. I think I was really talking about, thinking about moments when people may think something's not happening in the circle. Um, that they're looking for maybe a level of listening or a level of sharing and thinking something's not happening and how that actually is a somatic experience for us as you know anybody who's holding circle you can almost feel that in your body um and that that is um those thoughts actually if we connect them to our bodies they actually create more presence for us and the more present uh the more presence we bring into a circle the more that energetic shift is activated so that's what I was thinking about in terms of the, the real, the physical experience of that in working all the thoughts back in through the body and how that creates more presence and creates more of what I think the medicine or the healing actually is. Mm. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that was just so beautifully said. Because sometimes we get lost in this idea of things are not happening the way we want. Mm -hmm. and, and that does become a barrier because we've moved from the intention to, to connect to the intention of agenda. And um, 
And so, yes, having awareness. And sometimes we can't have awareness in the moment. <laughs> And so debriefing is critical so that the next time we we're aware, oh my God, this is how it showed up in my body. This is the thought process it led down to. And, and that a meditation we did of coming back to our senses, if we practice that regularly, maybe we can come to that and go, oh yeah, here I am in the room. This is the person that's here and I'm here to connect. I'm not here to make them confess to what they did and and make them agree to a particular item that i think would just make this contract perfect or make them share things a particular way so thank you for that 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 is just so important for us as practitioners um to have that awareness sometimes we may not really do well with a personality and that's where a co-facilitator for a repair process is important <laughs> because then we can debrief and um, that's where just giving ourselves that moment of empathy we'll talk more about empathy in two weeks when we talk about nonviolent communication and connecting to like i really have a strong need right now i'm feeling sad i'm feeling scared and i have a strong need to to contribute to the well-being of the circle and everybody in the circle um and being aware that oh my gosh you know like i'm doing my best and these other people are doing their best and and is it working for me to 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 be so strongly held to wanting to contribute um it's hard to let go and and trust group wisdom until you've experienced it over and over and over again if i might um just share just um there there was a circle that i was facilitating um i'll keep it brief but i have a quick anecdote if that's okay jessica oh absolutely please. Um, the just on this this um, thread here, um, I was the lead facilitator. I had a wonderful co-facilitator that you know. You'll notice that there, a lot of times there's um, certain pairings of of teams in facilitation that work so well together. Uh, the nonverbal, the, um, the 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 shared trust, and we were working on um, a sexual assault case and we were working in the primary circle. We'd already pre-conferenced and there was just this massive amount of shame with this young man who um, basically just literally could not speak. Um, he was unable to, to respond um, or, or to contribute verbally. And so what my co-facilitator and I did um, with my lead, which was extremely counterintuitive for me in many ways, because, you know, this is about the verbal realm and, you know, sharing what happened, um, the impact our ne and sharing needs and feelings and meaning. But what we did was we honored his silence. And in, in this young man's case, he was the um, author of The Harm. Um, but there was more to it than that. But still, he, he carried a massive amount of shame into that circle, and he literally could not speak. So what we did is we sat there in silence for 15 minutes. <laughs> I kid you not. And the whole time, I was feeling um, really completely like these um, dualistic feelings of like, shouldn't I be doing it differently? And then a voice was saying, well, just trust that you're allowing, trust that you're allowing his, um, his, his silence to be okay. And what happened eventually, because of that allowance, because of that, uh, this energetic shift that, that we allowed um, out of that silence, he ended up having an extraordinary breakthrough of um, being able to express his needs and feelings. 
it was a quite extraordinary experience. And so I think just to close this, um, trusting that sometimes circle is going to ask you to um, do what might seem very counterintuitive and to honor that in ways that, um, you know, in this, in this case, surprisingly, um, created a container of safety for that young man to, even after 15 minutes of silence, finally be able to feel like he could express. So that's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on? There are quite a few more. Um, but maybe we could come back to them if that's okay with everybody so that um, Jessica can continue for a bit. I'd like to actually come back to what Tanya brought as well, if we have time. Yeah, and, and I wanna encourage, I, I don't know if there's a way for everybody to connect um, between sessions. And I, I wanna encourage that this conversation happen in small group between sessions so that you rely on each other's expertise and knowledge and experience because that's how we learn um we learn from each other in and debriefing after circle and and just connecting right now as learners between sessions i think is valuable because there's so much wisdom in this group that we have we have brought together with this webinar um, and, and I can feel it and I feel so humbled by it, <laughs> incredibly humbled by it. So, um, with that said, um, around, I, I want to transition into how the brain works and develops and it, it ties into this question of how do we go back to being in a regulated and present state? Um, so as we think about how the brain develops, it begins with the brain stem and the diencephalon in utero, and that just onboards our phys physiological processes of, of a heartbeat and brain development and, and our organs developing and eventually being able to breathe and regulate our temperature. And then... Um, after birth, our limbic system begins to develop, and that's our ability to socialize and to be together, and, and then our, our thinking capacities begin to develop, um, and that, that's a process that happens um, beginning probably at age two plus. Um, and one thing that is really cool to know is that um, our neurons uh, fire up and, and grow with positively attuned relational interactions. And I think particularly uh, in this age of technology, we need to be aware in family settings of the importance of face-to-face -face contact and touch. Um, so it, this is a sad statistic for me. Um, I, it's about eight years old, and it's uh, regarding the brain development and the number of interactions that a 17-year-old, let's say it's about eight, 10 years ago, had over the course of his or her or their lifetime um, in entirety was the equivalent of what a three-year-old had had 30 years before that. So when you think about that, that speaks a lot to brain development and the importance of restorative practices because restorative practices bring us all together in circle to just connect, to have eye contact, to feel each other, to know each other at a deeper level. Jessica, just a quick request. Um, would you be willing to maximize or, or excuse me, put your slide into pre present mode? Um, thank you. That. All That's right. Great. <laughs> I think that works. And Nancy's asking, can you repeat that statistic, please? Yes. So that is a 17-year-old over the course of his or her or their lifetime had had as much relational, positively attuned relational interaction, which means one-on-one -on -one, um, 
attuned meaning, like somebody got them, understood them, um, positive meaning that it's about encouragement and being seen for your light. Um, relational interaction as a three-year-old had uh, 30 years before. All right, so now I'm gonna move on to, um, I, I find this really fascinating, the connection between how the brain develops, how the brain works, and the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it says at the bottom that our physiological needs and safety needs need to be taken care of. And that's what the brain stem and diencephalon do for us. They ensure that, that we are safe, that our physiological needs are, are taken care of. And, and for those of us who are teachers, we know how important it is to have kids that feel safe, that are well fed, that are properly clothed. Um, and then the limbic system, the needs for belonging and love and um, esteem are, are important. And then comes the reasoning. And so much of the time we're so focused on trying to teach skills of math reading um, and without the foundation of, of physical safety and well-being and emotional and, um, and social well-being, I think, you know, this, we, it's hard to learn. It's hard to reason. And that's where a lot of trauma, I think, occurs. It's that, that we, we have, we've, like, haven't fully developed all parts of ourselves. So, um, so what this begs for me is like this question of, I think a lot of times when you think about if we're not taking care of ourselves, we're more likely to be activated. So I, I like to use the term halt, hungry, angry, lonely, tired, sick, sad, scared, then we're, we're we're so likely that if something happens to get triggered into a past trauma and to be reactive. So being biologically respectful means that we are aware that if we're not in a good place, when input goes in, that we're more likely to remember, oh my God, that smell is related or that action or movement is related to something awful that happened to me. So I'm gonna go into fear. I'm going to go into flight. I'm going to go into some sort of reactive state um, where I'm not fully present and I'm just in, in autopilot. So to come in and try to correct that is before you've regulated the person and related to them is really difficult. And, and, and for some people, they disassociate in their reaction, reactionary state. And so to ask them to remember is, is a really um, difficult thing for them to do. Um, and so being biologically respectful also means having developmentally appropriate reflection. So here's a statistic that is also sad. So a lot of two and three-year-olds um, experience physical abuse because verbally they have the skills to say no and parents or adults in their lives look, look at that no as um, being disobedient or resisting them. And so if we don't know that developmentally that two-year-old is just playing with language, has not yet learned language, has not yet learned the, the, what, the, what the word no means, um, then we're not going to respond to them properly. <clears throat> so I, I encourage that we just have that awareness of let's be developmentally appropriate. Um, it's not fair to ask for a reasoning capacity of a young child or a, a full reasoning capacity of a teenager because the brain doesn't fully develop till age 25. So I'm going to talk about self-care, um, especially in the family setting during these challenging times. Um, it is so important to take care of our physical needs proper nutrition, sleep. Um, and during stress, it's easier to not 
go for proper nutrition. But if we could just pause for a moment and think, this is an act of love for myself and my family. And how can I comfort myself in a way that is more life enriching? Um, I, I want to encourage that. And I know sleep is very difficult during stressful times. Um, a tool that I offer is doing a gratitude tool at night. Um, so I like to go through the gratitude alphabet if my mind is racing. Uh, or if I'm worried about something, just having a notebook right by my t um, bed stand where I write everything that needs to be taken care of and I take care of it the next day. So I know it's bookmarked. And um, emotional needs are important to meet, uh, especially if we're stuck at home right now, which many of us are, and are not getting interaction with others, the social and emotional interaction we need. Um, and we just have young kids. They can't meet us socially and emotionally in the way that adults need, uh, can. And meeting our mental and spiritual needs as well. So um, I wanna encourage that now. Um, this, is per this is a particularly important moment in time, I think, as our lives have changed and transitioned so dramatically as we're asked to stay at home. Um, uh, and I just encourage it for everybody, make it transparent, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm stressed right now. I'm going to take care of myself in this way. I'm going to take a nap. I'm, um, I'm just going to check. Am I hungry? Like physically hungry, not emotionally hungry. <laughs> if I'm emotionally hungry, you know, connect with a friend. If I'm socially hungry, connect with a friend, um, do some mental exercises and, Connect, when I say spiritual needs, I, I heard somebody say something beautiful about spiritual needs, and which is the spirit, like having a ritual for your spirit. So it could be a, a walk. It could be time reading something that just feeds your soul. Um, it could be taking time to just like slowly drink hot water and feeling it in your body. Um, or tasting your coffee or tasting your lunch. Um, so boundaries, uh, years ago, um, I was working with a therapist and she said, you know, self-care isn't about bubble baths. It's about having impeccable boundaries. And um, so I think having really good boundaries and respecting the boundaries of people in your household is important. It's an act of saying, I love you, I love me, I love us. And um, so let's figure out how we can be respectful with one another. Any questions about that? I don't see this chat in here. Um, should I just move on, Molly, can I? I'm here for you, dear. Um... It doesn't look like there's any questions, but again, just um, if you want to speak, open up your mic or let me know and I'll do it for you. Um, let's see. Also, uh, Jessica, as far as your chat screen, there should be a spot on your um, toolbar to open it up, or it might be a dot, 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 and then you can open it up from there. But rest assured, I'm, I'm watching it for, okay. for you. Yeah. All right, yeah, because when I'm in full screen, I don't see the Zoom options. I don't. Yeah, they, they have a tendency to hide. <laughs> there we go, okay. All right. Um, I get it, all right. Um, Tanya's asking um, for a request that I appreciate. Um, she says, can we hold questions until the end? Um, they're just due to time sensitivity for for others as well as Tanya. Um, and yes, of course this will be recorded. Every session is. So we'll make sure that that's posted on your resources and assets website. Thank All you. Right. So I will do that. Thank you for making that request. Um, and, and that's just, I think, an adjustment to webinar. <laughs> so thank you for the feedback and, and appreciating the opportunity to learn. Um, so regulation, so we talked about the three R's of regulate, relate, reason. So during this time, um, having routines is important, having rhythm is important. Um, 
So invoking our senses, paying attention to texture, smells, um, while we're eating food, it can become a game. Like, oh my God, what, what texture did you notice in this food today? Or is there a, a spice that you notice that may be new or that you didn't notice before? Or when listening to music, noticing the different instruments or beats or um, octaves of voices. Um, and at the end of the day, spending time to recall what happened. Uh, that's a way to um, begin to be more mindful in our days. If we know, oh, okay, at the end of the day, mm, yeah, I'm just going to try to relate to whoever um, how my day was and what I did during the day. I don't know about you, sometimes I'm just in su such autopilot that I forget what I had for breakfast. Um, <laughs> and, and so by having an exercise or a routine where I'm sharing with somebody at the end of the day what I've done, I have more awareness. Um, and so I'm more, less likely to be reactive. Um, and in the moment, if you're noticing that, that you're not fully present, you can bring yourself back to your senses. Um, and I do want to say connection circles, when used routinely, following the rhythm, um, following a certain rhythm and the structure of passing a talking piece can be really regulating. And some families have adopted some indigenous culture practices of having a drum beat in the background that is at the same beat as the heartbeat of a mother in utero. So that's worth trying. It may be annoying for some families. It's just, you know, just try it. This is all a learning process for everybody. Um, and I was gonna do this exercise, but I've gone past this time. So between sessions, um, this, this coming to senses exercise is notice yourself um, if you can pair up with somebody in your household or a friend or with somebody else who's taking this webinar, um, come up with a situation between a really traumatic uh, 10 and not traumatic zero that's at about two or three. Think about it. Notice your body language um, and when you're impaired, like have the other person as you're sharing about that situation. Um, notice what you're doing, how you're talking, what's going on in your body, and have them reflect it back to you. And then continue to think of that. And your partner is going to ask you to come back to your senses. They'll ask you, what are you saying? What are you smelling? What are you hearing? What are you tasting? And what is the temperature of your fingertips and toes? And I think what you'll notice is this dramatic calming ability and ability to just go back to being relational in a non-reactive way and being able to reason. So um, a bit about the importance of relating in a positively attuned way um, and not cr crossing the intimacy barrier. So it's really easy when we're st first starting uh, restorative practices to want to go into really intimate questions. And so like with any connection circle, you start with, you know, what's your favorite food? What did you do today? Uh, instead of like, what is the most difficult moment of your life? Um, because we want to, we want to build up to that. We want to build the trust and respect. And so that's what intimacy barrier means. And respect is important. Um, so particularly boundaries and realistic expectations. So um, I would like us to break up into groups and do the assets based uh, survey. Oh, let me, let me get out of this. Um, you've all received this uh, handout and I'm gonna go through it really quickly. It's a survey that was published as Appendix 4 of Dr. Title's book, Teaching Peace, a Restorative Justice Framework for Strengthening Relationships. Um, if you don't have a copy of that book, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, she talks about restorative 
justice, but she also talks about how restorative practices are a way of living. Um, so uh, this, the assets survey, I think, is unique to some programs. Um, when you go into a restorative process, after talking about the harms and having them reflected back, the person whose behavior um, became harmful um, is asked in pre-conference about their interests and what they're good at. And this is the asset survey that is used before going into the contract phase. And it's read back in circle. And I want us to become familiar with this and use this as a way to get to know each other. Um, because it's surprising, like sometimes we don't know much about what's going on in our family members' lives. And this is a good icebreaker, set of icebreakers. Molly has referred to other icebreakers in previous sessions. So the questions are name one or two adults, people who care about you and help you succeed. How do they help support your success? Do you believe you have friends you can count on to be there for you? How many? Who do you care about? What are you good at? Like, this is particularly interesting because sometimes people don't see what they're good at. And, and so it's also a moment to reflect back to them like, oh, I see this as well about you. What types of jobs do you like to do or what service opportunity, a service to the community interests you? What do you like to learn about in school? Um, what do you like to learn that is not taught in school or outside of work? Uh, what makes you special or different? What do you do to help yourself when you're feeling alone, nervous, or upset? So this is a good way to know about how different people regulate in your family or your household or your workplace. Um, what do you do to stay healthy? What organizations do you belong to? Who do you help and how do you help them? So a need for contribution is so critical um, and we all share it. Uh, when have you ever had a chance to be a leader and how did you like it? What are the goals? Where would you like to be in two, five, 10 years? Um, if you have the power to change the world, what would you do? And is there anything else you'd like to, people to know about you? So these are really powerful, powerful getting to know you questions that don't necessarily cross the intimacy barrier. Um, and I say necessarily because we don't know about people's shame level a lot of times. So for, for most people, you're not crossing the int intimacy barrier and in asking this question. So at this point, if we could break up into our um, breakout sessions and share with each other, ask each other two or three of these questions and just listen and then switch turns. Um, I would appreciate that. And um, I'm going to go ahead and put people back into similar rooms if that's good, Jessica. So the same idea, small groups. Yeah, so just two because of our, our time limitations. So if we could roughly do two and a half minutes a person. Okay. Um, there's good. a couple rooms that have more than two. Um, but just to allow them to continue together, would that be okay to have, um, yeah, yeah, please. Okay, great. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the rooms and just a reminder that, that you did get these documents and this, um, survey, I think, right. In the email, Jessica. Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. We're going to open up our rooms now. Thank you. Oh, and Jessica, how long are the breakout groups today? Or I mean, for this one.
Can you hear me, Yvette? Yes, I can. I'm so sorry. That's so weird. I saw you in the room and now, and I'm also trying to get Rita into her room. So there's two people for some reason who didn't well, get in. Back, so that might have redone things. I don't know. So. Yeah. I love, I, um, I just want to say how beautiful your, um, just the view of you and the picture behind you. <laughs> Gorgeous. Um, so let's see here. Let me try again to get you in. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't flown yet. <laughs> You're about to. Enjoy. <laughs>
So that was weird. What happened? It landed into a space where the two people kept talking to each other and never acknowledged my presence. Uh, I waited and listened for a while and there was just no space huh. for me. So I just, I backed back out. It just, well, you know. Um, would you like to be here together in for sure. a few minutes? <laughs> Here's good. Here, where I am. <laughs> Me too. I'll be right here right now. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm trying to recall what what she had asked us to for the prompt, um, but I would just like to see. She invited, she invited us to look at the questions and to respond to a couple of the questions, given the time that was allotted. Do you have one that you'd like to start out with? Um, let's see, one that I really liked, uh, um, uh, what are you good at? That's a difficult one for me, so I think I'll start there. Okay. <laughs> um, what am I good at? Um, I'm good at listening. I'm also good at uh, listening to my own spirit's guidance and responding to that in the moment in ways that are uh, honoring and respectful to both myself and other people. That's one of the things I'm good at. Mm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just to reflect, um, if I might, the, that is a, a highly attuned skill mm -hmm. um, to be able to be in that subtle space of attunement in the moment. Mm -hmm. So just appreciating and honoring that. That's quite a journey to come to that place. Yeah, thank you. Um, and your presence it, it, without words speaks of listening you know being present which is another big life long journey <laughs> yes so i'm really grateful to be here with you i'm molly as you know and i'm um i'm really happy that this worked out so um i'm sitting on Ute lands here in in the high desert of Colorado okay. and I'm really interested in what Tanya brought today um, she and I have been having some good conversations in our coaching sessions um, about cultural culturally appropriate practice so I think what I'm what I'm good at is um, as it applies to this field I've had so many people speak to me, share with me, listen to me from so many different perspectives from all over the world. And um, I feel like I'm really good at bringing it back to the simple, um, in my own style, of course, in my slower pace of speaking and everything, but that, that we, regardless of where we are, where we're from, we, you know, we share, um, we, we bring it back to, to uh, the listening to our community to create the values and practices that are appropriate for us, that we agree on together. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like I'm good at upholding that um, when we work with people and reminding them just to bring it back to you and, and the people you're with mm -hmm. and what they need, you know, what, what are their needs? <laughs> So, yeah, I appreciate yeah. your, I appreciate your keeping it simple and um, being able to hear, hear and connect with people's hearts and minds and souls and even, even uh, within the con within the container. It sounds like you're, you pay attention to the container um, and uh, you're able to uphold that in a way that feels fluid and authentic to yourself which is important modeling anytime we do this work, you know, it's very essential to this work. 
It's so hard to, sometimes I feel very inadequate at describing what that means, you know, the container. That's right, yep. So it looks like people are coming back. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Yvette. I really appreciate you. So uh, we're gonna bring everybody back now. I'm just gonna send a quick note. And the breakout rooms are closing in 57 seconds. <laughs> and that means your audio will come back on too, Jessica. We're going to have to figure that one out. We, and we have a, a wonderful community of support on that one. Melissa, I'm really appreciating you for all your um, insights today. Thank you. Molly, I'm going to have to leave. I've got to call a student. So I just want to thank you for running these meetings and for everything I've learned. Oh, thank you so much. And, and who's this? This is Rita. Sorry. Rita. Rita, good to see you again today. Thank you so much for being a part of this community. Thank you. It was really see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. So the breakout rooms are just about to close. And then we should have everybody back, Jessica. OK, looks like everybody's back. And you have to unmute your phone like you did last time. Oh. All right. <laughs> I'm seeing some smiles on faces, so I'm guessing that that time to connect was, was an emotional tank-filling experience. Um, I, I know I feel just so much more grounded after that. And I thank my partners and I thank all of you for, for doing this exercise. Um, and just know it's available to you anytime you're with anybody uh, to, to ask a different question than what is your role in life, but it, and, and ask a question of like, what makes you you? Um, so let's see now. So to go uh, to review the five R's, um, relationship, respect, responsibility, repair, reintegration. And within the context of family, um, I love this quote by Dr. Bruce Perry. Uh, he is a psychiatrist and neuroscientist um, who works with childhood trauma. And I would recommend looking at his website the Child Trauma Academy. Uh, he talks about this neurosequential model of therapy. So going back to that moment when you've had trauma, but he talks about uh, really beautifully the importance of relationships. Um, and he says that the currency for um, systemic change is trust and tr trust comes through forming uh, healthy working relationships. People, not programs, change people. And this goes back to that intention to connect and to make relationship primary and important. Um, and within the context of family, sometimes this means I'm, I'm working with this mother right now um, and we've been working for a while and, and she just came to this realization, she's having to take care of her child and, and work full time and she said, my child's an extrovert. He needs contact and connection, and I can't give it to him. Um, and at, at times, I've had to put him before my work because, because it's that important that we remain connected and attached. Um, and when we don't remain connected and attached, we pay for it later. So um, just taking that time is important. Um, so respect within the context of family practices. Uh, some, some of us have generational questions that come up. So um, we might be trying to create a restorative family and we've got parents who say obedience is respect and redefining that is an evolutionary process. And, and I, I know for me that as I try to raise my son, with a restorative mindset, my, my uh, family would look at me and say like, you should have an obedient and compliant child. And it took a lot of 
um, support from my restorative family to stay steadfast and not want to go back to, you've got to do what I want you to do. Um, and, 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 and to really create respect in our relationship and to realize it's an evolving process as my child grows and uh, becomes an adult now. Um, and it was evolving all along. So, so just going back to those guideline questions is important. Uh, responsibility. Um, so this comes back to something I spoke to before, which is being transparent. And it's scary, I think, at times to be transparent as an adult with a child, if that's how you're practicing within a fa family, and just saying, I'm not an expert. Um, and, it, and there's a tricky line when we're practicing with children to not make them resp responsible for adult things and not to reveal adult things to them. Um, and just being transparent about, okay, this process is is one I'm learning um, and it's okay for you to call me on when I'm trying to control you um, and we can go into a repair process about it and, and we're all important in this family system. So I have a favorite book, it's The Country Bunny and the Golden Shoes. Um, and it's a children's book from the 1930s, I think, and it's in the resource list. And it's about this country bunny who's a single mom and she has 21, I think 21 little bunnies that she takes care of and she wants to be the Easter bunny. And everybody's poo-pooing her and saying, there's no way. And so what she does is she says, yes, there is. And in her family, each one of the children has a different role based on their strengths. And co-ownership is so critical in that family system to make it possible for her to become the Easter Bunny. So one's an artist, one's really good at setting the table, one's really good at cooking, one's, one's really good at manners. So really drawing on, on um, everybody's strengths and making space for people to develop and grow is important. Um, so is group wisdom. Uh, sometimes, we may be blind to something and and making space for various voices in our family can open us up to to new possibilities um i i just think of the many times that had i not allowed my son to have his voice i may have continued with bad habits that weren't good for me or him uh, and as well as an, an asset space approach um, so repair within the context of family practices. I think it's important to remember this quote again by Dr. Perry, so often trauma happens in relationships, but it is also in relationships that healing occurs. So just remembering that we don't have to show up perfectly. We just have to show up with the intention of doing, doing well in relationship and and if we don't today, we've got tomorrow. If we don't this moment, we've got the next moment. Um, I, I laugh often and think, oh my God, I'm, I'm living the Groundhog movie. <laughs> I, I just get a chance every day and I've got to come back and redo it. Um, and my goal isn't perfect, being a perfect mom anymore. It's not being a perfect anything. It's just being the best version of myself I can be any particular day. So reintegration um, within the context of family practices, um, it's a recognition that each person is integral to the functioning of the whole and we can't, throw, we can't afford a throwaway attitude. Um, and this becomes really difficult. So even let's say, you know, like we're, we, we're in a moment of crisis and, and we've just drifted apart knowing we'll come back. We'll come back when we set, set that as our goal to come back and be reintegrated as a whole and we'll figure it out. Um, I wanted to show you this um, matrix that I created a while ago because it helps me visualize the restorative practices. So I look at the spectrum from connection circles to restorative justice conferences to reintegration circles um, 
and and I and I like to put it as like relationship, respect, responsibility, re re repair, and reintegration, which are on the on the bottom. Um, and how you know we're building up with each practice uh, the the five R's and. Um, responsibility again is not only responsibility for our actions, but it's responsibility for the good of the whole um, and responsibility for ourselves. So we go from relationship building and maintenance uh, with connection circles, solution circles, peacemaking circles to maintenance and repair with peacemaking circles, converse, restorative conversations, restorative justice. Um, and reintegration circles. Um, so uh, when we're facilitators in a family system or anywhere, um, we're not the leaders. We don't have to control how the process goes. Um, and, and it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> it is so hard when we're responsible for so much to not want to slip into, I'm going to control this process. Um, and so just coming back to, okay, the intention is to connect, build, maintain, and repair a relationship. Um, and eventually we want everyone to take on the role and a uh, facilitator and be co-owners in the paradigm. Um, so I, I look at parenting just as I do facilitation or teaching uh, a workshop as my role is to just make, make the next expert, uh, to just work myself out of the job. Um, because by empowering other people, um, I, I get to share, I get to learn, and other people get to step into their power. Um, so trauma within the context of family practices, we can't be experts at everything. Um, and we can't be experts at trauma care. Um, but if we remember that concept of regulate, relate, reason as our guiding principle, I think it will help us understand that sometimes when people don't show up at their best, maybe they're in a traumatic state. And instead of trying to correct them, um, maybe we want to connect with them and help them regulate. Um, and I, I remember Bruce Perry talking about um, his therapy uh, practice. And he thought, oh, my God, we're such great therapists. And we started, like, looking at the data. And what, what he noticed is that the kids who were responding best were the ones who had the longest drive to get to uh, their sessions. And it was because they were getting regulated in the car. <laughs> and so they were open to whatever happened relationally in the therapy sessions. And he said, um, so there, there's a much bigger context. There are relationships, not only of the parent, but the community with our children or with each other um, or with us uh, as individuals. And, and there's a lot more. So if you can remember, it's not all on you. You don't have to be an expert. Uh, and if you can remember this framework of regulate, relate, reason as your guiding principle, I think it will give you some perspective. So here's some resources. I have a list of books. Um, uh, there are websites that I recommend and uh, you can reach me. You, I have a weekly Wednesday, 1.30 to 2.20 gratitude free session. Just call in, we start with a uh, meditation and then we go round robin in connection circle format sharing what we're grateful for and sometimes it's thematic and it's a phone call you can uh, reach out to me or go to that Facebook event page to see what um, how to get into it so I want to with that I think I'm at the last slide I want to thank you all for participating and um, for your enthusiasm, enthusiasm and for growing the restorative culture around the globe. Thank you. Mm. Thank you so much, Jessica. It's been such a wonderful experience to have you with us today and hopefully we'll have you back 
um, I think for the NBC session especially, correct? Yes, and yes. Jessica and I are um, co-creating something that um, is going to be coming down the pipeline in um, the coming months in the near future, um, specific to, to a little bit more of a dive into what she shared today. So just wanting to pinpoint that and highly encourage you uh, to attend the circles that she's offering and to support her work um, in any way you feel drawn to. Um, so a reminder, the, this slide deck will be available to you. Um, it, I, I believe Jessica's gonna send it to me and we're gonna post it on the resource page, okay? So hopefully all of you are getting the emails from rjonrise at gmail. That, that means um, intercession updates, and I always make sure you get a notice when the current week's recording goes up with its commensurate resources. So don't forget, too, that there's additional um, resources that are on that page, and um, I've created a couple little pockets there um, and links for you. And um, I, I just want to close today by honoring Tanya for bringing that um, culturally um, appropriate perspective into the space. And um, the, my style is only one style. <laughs> and I had such a good conversation with Tanya. And I think it's so important to, to as Kay Pranis and um, Nancy Riestenberg say, bring it back to the immediate needs of the people that you're with and do a listening process about what those needs are, including about the style in which facilitation um, might be most appropriate, including the guidelines for your online space. So um, really encouraging just to bring it back to the immediate values and needs of the people that you're in circle with um, and go from there. Trusting the wisdom that's in the room, whether it's virtual or an actual room. So with that, I just want to honor Jessica again. Um, if Does anyone have um, any comments or questions? Jessica, do you have a few minutes to, to stay if people have questions? Oh, absolutely. So let's open it back up just to close out today um, in case anyone wants to speak or type anything. And thank you, Yvette. Um, she says, thank you, everyone, for bringing your best selves to this sacred space. Thank you, Jessica, for this offering. Great first webinar. <laughs> thank you. I, I did want to offer um, between sessions, uh, that there was that question about how do we measure relationship? Um, maybe if you can ask each other, uh, and ask yourselves between now and the next session, um, the questions of how do you know you are valued and safe in a relationship? Um, that might give you some inklings of measures that you would want. Mm, that's good. Thank you all, it's been such an honor and privilege. And thank you everyone so much. This is a wonderful community to be a part of and um, thank you for your support in just the facilitation of this group. We're in this together and as you go out and create your own communities online, um, remember to listen and create safe space for everyone's voice to be heard as you create those values and guidelines for your own work. Um, and we'll see you next week. Uh, one last reminder, Thursday, our connection circle. I'm talking with a couple people who might be interested in facilitating. At the top of the hour or um, class today, I said it's moving week for my family, ironically. So I'm, Thursday's the only day that I am not going to have internet and there's really nothing I can do about it. So I'm going to um, update you all on Thursday's circle, but it's still happening as of now. And um, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Jessica.
Thank, thank you. you. All. Take Bye. care of yourselves. Take Be care safe. of yourselves and each other. Thank you, Jessica. Beautiful presentation. Thank Appreciate you. It. You're welcome. And I've unmuted all of you, so if you want to say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Bye. Bye Jessica. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Oops. 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 How did I get here? <laughs> <laughs> you, got, you look like you live in a palace. <laughs>